Welcome to episode number 28. And now listen to our awesome theme song, which I figured out how to make it work. Courtesy of Leah Zakari. It is an earworm. song john james yeah <laughs> all right that's enough you, you got it, it. Yeah. we should have just ended at the get mad today part right uh, I, that's the credits version actually it's the one that's supposed to roll when all the credits go that's fine all right well good afternoon all of you out there in comp land hopefully eating your lunch um we're gonna be short today we've got a really nice discreet well-packaged topic, um, and it's going to be presented by me, James Cousins, and uh, our intrepid leader, Melissa Day. I'm just the color, color she, commentary today. She is the commentary today. Um, just as a quick reminder, this presentation is for educational purposes only, and any of the comments that we make in here are only for educational purposes and are not to be construed as legal advice, nor do they constitute the creation of an attorney-client relationship, even though many of you out there have made very wise decisions to make us your attorney. If you haven't, ask yourself the question for the next 30 minutes, why haven't you? So we're gonna talk today, as you can see, about the 130 week credit. This is a new change, 2017. Now the 2017 amendments were a long time ago, it seems like, particularly with the pandemic in between, it seems like they were a decade ago. Um, but this is a new topic. And it's a new topic because when it came into law, it had no force in effect for 130 weeks after it came into law. So now we're sort of in the middle of it. It's starting to develop into a real legal purpose. It's got a real legal principles and it's got some case laws we'll see later on. So now is the time that I think we need to start talking about this, this particular uh, section of the reforms of section 15.3 W. So it all started with the reforms. We know that in 2017, there were lots of reforms and we hated most of them. So, you know, cl claimants that were classified and found attached to the labor market, you could no longer raise labor market attachment ever. They allowed mandatory full board review for panel rulings that reduce a person's LWEC below the um, threshold for extreme hardship. They also lowered the threshold from extreme hardship from 81 to 76. They also created this section of 15.3 W. They describe it as a safety valve in their public announcements, but they only do that because it was favorable to business. <laughs> it was not favorable to claimants. <clears throat> the 2007 reforms. This is, this is my commentary. You can disagree with this if you want. The 2007 reforms proved to be a significant failure for business. Right. I did practice long enough to have spent quite a bit of time settling and handling pre-cap cases. And it seemed to me anecdotally that we were paying more to settle post-cap cases than we were to settling pre-cap lifetime claims. So we got these caps with the idea that we could put some sort of finite end on claims that previously lasted forever. But it turns out that a lot of judges in concert with claimants counsel had done their best to prevent us from enjoying caps on lots of cases. So what the board responding to a lot of pressure from business and carriers um, decided to create an expedited permanency part out here in Buffalo at the time it was part 29 and they assigned the crankiest most annoying judge they could to that part and its entire purpose was to essentially force cases into having caps running. And they didn't identify the cases about whether it was appropriate. They just looked at the age of the case and said, it's old enough, it should be capped. And they put it on the calendar and directed the parties to start getting permanency proofs because they were trying to accomplish through board procedure what the legislation had failed to accomplish through statute, which was to 
allow carriers to enjoy the benefit of capped claims. The claimant's bar took tons of advantage of the board's unwillingness to do anything about this, even once they created the permanency parts. What was also funny was at the same time, um, people had been mysteriously been given 81% LWEX, um, you know, because we know that that was the trigger for extreme hardship. And then they were getting 76s. So essentially, we got hosed at both ends from the reforms, by and large. And anecdotally, claim costs appeared to be going up. At least from our perspective, we were seeing claims settling for more than they would have settled had they been uncapped claims that occurred at a 400 rate. And we had given up in 2007 the 400 max rate. And now we're, we're I think we're going to be over $1,000. Yeah. So, so, you know, this was a bad bargain. So in 2017, they came back. And, and I think, James, just some of that recent case law has like been the final abrogation of any benefit that employers and carriers got from the caps, seeing as the, the third department has now said that upon death, it's the, you get the balance of the, the estate gets the balance of the weeks that haven't been paid to the claimant yet. Right. And, and, and Jacoby and its progeny, you know, like the, the, the Jacoby progeny basically said the cap doesn't mean anything. If a claimant has post-classification surgery, you're just going to reclassify the claimant. You may get a credit for some weeks of benefits paid based on you know when those caps were running in the first instance. But essentially, yeah, our caps mean nothing at this point. You know, the interesting is that you get a guy, somebody classified with a 75% disability. So that entitles them to what, 425 weeks? Yeah, I think it's 400 actually, but yeah. 400 weeks. So um, they are, have returned to work earning in excess of their average weekly wage at the time that they're classified. So they're not entitled to benefits. They then retire for reasons unrelated to their disability. And so again, they're not entitled to benefits. And then they die. Do they get 425 weeks of benefits upon their death? They shouldn't. No, <laughs> that would be my answer. But I mean, according to the, the third department now, it seems as though since it's an unpaid benefit to which the person would be entitled if they could show that they were reattached to the labor market in some way, despite the voluntary withdrawal from the labor market, that then they would, the, the estate would get 425 weeks of benefits. Well, if that's the case, then the workers' compensation law will be well and truly broken. It, I, I think it's pretty close right now. Yeah, it is pretty close. It's hanging on by a thread. Yeah. It, it is a retracted full thickness rotator cuff tear. We're just looking for the next accident for this, <laughs> this whole system to be totally useless. Um, so what did we get in the 2017 reforms to try and help everybody out to deal with this problem of claimants dragging their feet and counsel dragging their feet and judges being complicit, quite frankly, in preventing the imposition of the caps? So a wise Jedi once told me, you start with the text. So we're going to look at the text of the statute. Boy, that's a lot of stuff to read. I only like to read stuff that long once. So what I did for everyone here was I read it once very carefully. And then I translated it from total gobbledygook legalese that lawyers in the legislature, which by the way, lawyers elected to office, in my opinion, are typically the worst lawyers because they don't practice very good. And then they go write laws that are terrible. But in any event, here's what it translates to. Where an employer has paid 130 weeks of temporary benefits, all weeks paid thereafter will be counted as a credit against any later set PPD cap, even if that lost time is intermittent. So the board had imposed this expedited permanency part saying that, you know, cases of a certain age should just be pushed into the permanency process. This statute creates a presumption <clears throat> as a matter of law that if you've paid 130 weeks of temporary benefits to a claimant, all of them- I don't think they have to be temporary benefits. I mean, any, any it's 130 weeks after the date of accident, right? No. It can include temporary total benefits. No. You should have looked through the presentation. I can't see the <laughs> bottom of it. Are we missing some text there at the bottom? No, we're going to get there. Okay, I did look at it. Yeah, we'll get there. So, are, you, are you saying that if the person, I, I mean, you don't have to, it's not like the special fund situation where you had to pay 260 weeks of benefits before you were going to get reimbursement from special funds for your indemnity payments. You don't, like, like if the person doesn't have surgery for six months after the accident, and then they go out for a surgical procedure, and then they return back to work, to, to work 
I mean, the hundred, they don't have to, the, the employer carrier doesn't have to actually pay out of pocket 130 weeks of benefits, do they? Yes, because the text of the statute says provided compensation pursuant to subdivision five of this section. Right, but that's five, for payments after the, the 130 weeks from the date of accident or date of disability. Subdivision five of it's section temporary disability provides benefits. for temporary disability benefits. So the statute, and it says the word is provided. So the, the, the case law that we have, as limited as it is, makes it clear that temporary total doesn't apply, doesn't count, and that um, the benefits must actually be paid, although that's not expressly stated that the benefits must be paid in such a simple form. It does reflect the, the payment of benefits. And I read after 130 weeks. I just want to make this clear. Like you could have a case where somebody's PPD'd and they don't have any lost time and they don't receive any indemnity benefits until 130 weeks after the date of accident. Correct. The first time a carrier or an employer makes a payment of a benefit after 130 weeks, then it's potentially eligible to be accredited against the caps. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> but the text is impossible. So, you know, now we have the second part of the statute, which is for a claim with a date of accident or disablement after the effective date of this chapter, hama, hama, hama. What does this mean? And then we know, look in there, it says the carrier should not receive a credit. What does this mean? This is all that long text. What this means is the 30, 130 week cap on temporary benefits can be lifted if permanency is an issue and claimant produces evidence that she is not at MMI and the carrier has had a fair opportunity to produce its own IME on MMI and the board rules no MMI. So we get this four part test out of the statute. It's great. It's like right there. Um, and that's kind of, I mean, honest to God, this is what you pay counsel for in the first instance is to read that giant nonsense paragraph and turn it into four bullet points for you so that you can make something out of it. Right. Cause that's what we go into court. I mean, we say the same thing to judges. Judge, let me give you the bullet points. It makes it easy, right? So we want to take a little more history, right? So the statute is amended. And what do we know about it? Well, we know that on April 25th, the board issued a subject number announcing this. They talk about it as a safety valve. Um, they actually, they mentioned that we get this credit after 130 weeks, but they really downplay it. They say there's a safety valve for that. And then they go on to say the board will offer further guidance regarding application of the safety valve in the near future. Um, and this was when Ken Munley was the chair, by the way, that, that brief like flash in the pan moment where all sorts of things happened. Um, attorney's fees for claimants were being cut left and right, side down like the crops that harvest and changes were being made that thought they'd be favorable and that just couldn't happen. So they had to get rid of him. Um, so then in 2019, which is the next mention of it, by the way, so that the, I don't call that the near future, two years no. later, but two years later in the near future, I mean, for an administrative, a quasi judicial administrative agency, maybe two years is the near future, who knows? Like time moves more quickly for them. Um, but in any event, the WCB up, annual update report comes out General counsel at the time, Dave Wertheim, who's now executive director, um, gives this really great presentation and he cuts out each section of the reform and he points out that this part of the statute has not been yet been adjudicated because it couldn't have been because the statute became effective for dates of accident after April 9 and it hadn't been two and a half years after April 9 in order for him to have had any of his uh, ARD people or any of uh, Judge Panzer's judges make a ruling on this. So that was our only update. We do get this weird case, June 17, 2019. Some defense attorneys are trying to make some arguments that have to do with sort of the Jacoby matter, um, you know, about post-classification, you know, like what weeks you can count and what of temporary benefits you don't count, et cetera. And they reference this statute in their arguments. Um, but, you know, the board, you know, as sort of guidance, well, they're sort of like guidance, dicta guidance. And the, the board sort of says, yeah, we read that part of the statute. It doesn't apply to this case because it's a pre-effective date case. So as a, sorry. sorry as yeah, a, the, only, the only really interesting thing that I thought came out of the, um, Dave Wertheim's presentation in 2019 was the reference to the fact that um, 
the cap is uh, the credit against the caps is not available where the can cl claimant can show when the case is ripe. So right. as you and I discussed earlier today or yesterday about the language and the statute and determining when permanency is at issue. I mean, when the case is ripe, it's not a legal term of art and it's not like anything that's ever been defined under the regula regulations or in the case law. But certainly as practitioners, we have an understanding that when somebody says that the case is ripe for permanency, what that means. Right, right. And I think um, I'll add a little more uh, history uh, about the time of the Heritage Center's ruling, maybe a little bit before, maybe a little bit after we attended the CLE locally here in Buffalo where Dave Wertheim was present. And a lot of very pointed questions were asked by the claimants bar about how this was gonna work. And um, if I had walked up and answered the questions myself, I don't think they could have been answered better or more favorably for the defense. I mean, general counsel was pretty clear in his understanding that there may be a safety valve, but it's not automatic. It's going to require adjudication. And if you do nothing, you're SOL. The argument was, who's the burden? You know, who's got the burden? Who's got to take steps? To, to prevent this credit from being affected. And um, you know it was pretty clear that the board, at least general counsel at the time, thought that it was going to be the claimant. And it turns out that that's the case, which is great. Let's go to the next slide. So how does this actually work? May take, so employers may take a credit for any periods of temporary disability paid beyond 130 weeks. These extra weeks, these extra weeks will be credited against the weeks of the claimant's LWEC cap when it is later imposed. <clears throat> okay. The credit applies to any case with the date of accident after April 9th. So April 10 is the date, effective date, April 10. When they say after April 9, that just means April 10. That's another thing you pay your lawyers for, right? What does after April 9 mean? It means April 10. Um, that's just funny too, because they, another change they made was um, for LWECs above 75%, you get the... Um, the option of filing for extreme hardship. And there was a lot of confusion with the claimants bar. A lot of claimants bar attorneys were accepting 75% LWEC compromises. And we were giggling all the way to the bank because we knew that 76 was the threshold. It wasn't 75. I still don't know. Like some people, I don't think know that. Um, an injury occurring after April 10. So we did the math for you guys. Would be ripe when 130 weeks would run as of October 7, 2019. Okay, ignore the rest of that. Benefit payments include only temporary partial disability rates as of provisions referenced in section 15.5 benefits, okay? So this is a credit against temporary partial benefits paid after 130 weeks. The weeks must be paid by the text of the statute, provide benefits. You have to provide the benefits to get the, to get the benefit of the credit. Calculating your credit at the time of permanency, calculate how many weeks of temporary partial benefits you paid on this claim, because you may have paid more. Find your 130 week limit. Is it over 130 weeks? You may have a credit for those additional weeks. For example, if you paid temporary disability of 160 weeks, you'll have a 30 week credit, right? Did you pay less than 130 weeks? That's uh, wrong. I copied that down from something wrong. So ignore that. But if you're over 130 weeks, what have you paid? If it's temporary partial, you're going to get a credit for it. Why do we say may? Because the safety valve extends the period of temporary disability upon 2.5 years under certain circumstances, which means we can't take credit for those weeks. The good news, is, good news is, is that the board read the statute like I did for you guys earlier and set forth the four requirements, all of which must be met before the safety valve applies. Let's go back. I love talking about history. Um, this is sort of like, I love discussing things in historical context because A, it gives me an opportunity to pontificate. It gives me an opportunity to say pseudo political things about comp because, you know, comp is very sort of, when you're involved in it, it's very political, but it's weird. You know, it's not Democrats and Republicans. It's how does this work? And is this working right? And who's taking advantage of the system? So the claim is bar, as you might imagine, read this thing and said, we're going to try and take advantage of this. So there were a series of cases orchestrated by the same law firm, uh, the senior partner of which is heavily involved in the injured workers bar across the state, um, and attempted to turn the safety valve into essentially a toothless formality, right? I call this a tooth. They tried to say, 
the safety valves just sort of tripped and triggered automatically, like in a lot, like when it is in equipment, safety valves and mechanical devices are automatically tripped. They tried to take that position because safety valve is actually not a good term to use. It's the kind of term that a lawyer who knew nothing about mechanics would write into a piece of legislation, hence my comment about why lawyers are probably the wrong people to write statutes. But in any event, especially bad lawyers. Um, so what they tried to do first is simply file RFAs and get a gullible judge to find no MMI. Um, and then render this whole 130 week safety valve thing, this 130 week credit move by just triggering the safety valve. And that's the first case. This is the first case, matter of Fairfield Inn and Suites. This is the one that's gonna start everyone's string citation from now on. Um, and it's the board's been using it in its own string citations. So December 17, 2019 hearing, right? RFA filed November, which I just told you guys, like this didn't actually become ripe until October. So they didn't really let any grass grow under their feet, did they? They filed that RFA pretty darn quick in comp terms, got the case on for a hearing and told the judge, judge, the claimants got, uh, had surgery a couple months ago. In fact, it was like nine months ago at the time, 10 months ago. And the treating doctor says that the claimant's probably gonna be disabled for, another, for 18 months after the surgery to some degree and is still reporting a temporary disability benefit, a temporary disability rate. The judge, I just kind of feel like this is like CM Bella or something, I don't know. Or uh, there's one judge in Rochester. Probably not because it wasn't a nicest case, but. No, it probably would have been, oh, I'm gonna bet five bucks says it was Lawler in Rochester because it's a Connors and Ferris case. Um, who just found, yep, no MMI, trigger the safety valve. The carrier says, what the heck? We got screwed in 2007. Are you telling us that we got screwed again in 2017? Really? Are you kidding me? So they filed an appeal, of course. Like a furious, angry, like, you'd better do something about this board appeal. So the board actually lays out the four criteria exactly as we gave them to you at the beginning of the slide presentation. And they talk about number one. And they say in Fairfield in number one and number three are not met, which is great. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna talk about the couple of criteria that have been adjudicated and have comments on them because they're really, really strange what the board says about these things. And they mix facts in a way that doesn't make sense to me we'll get into that in a little bit. So I gave this to you in color. So um, just to sort of lay out the different facts so that you can sort of parse them out in your mind. I'm a very visual thinker. In Fairfield, the board finds that the safety valve was not triggered and it could not be triggered simply by the filing of an RFA and a claim by counsel that the claimant had not reached MMI. The board said, with regard to the issue of the first requirement, whether permanency was at issue, the board noted neither party had raised the issue of permanency, right? Now this is confusing because neither party had raised the issue of permanency, but I just told you they filed an RFA arguing no MMI. The board treats those as separate issues. No MMI, no MMI, and permanency as separate issues. So the board is sort of starting to stake some territory out saying, if permanency is not genuinely at issue, you can't trigger the safety valve. And we'll see some more examples of that. The second fact that they note, none of the claimants treating medical providers had filed a permanency report. Okay, that seems to go along with what I just told you. The board kind of wants the safety valve only to be triggered if permanency is genuinely at issue. That is to say, maybe somebody thinks that the claimant's permanent and somebody thinks that the claimant is not, right? But that's not the case here because all we have is a treating physician saying a temporary partial disability. And finally, they said the carrier had neither sought nor obtained an IME on the issue of permanency. So how can it, an, uh, something be at issue if the party in opposition hadn't had an opportunity to produce their own evidence, right? So that's sort of a question of joinder, which is this weird legal concept that an issue is raised when it's first brought up but an issue is not joined until the party in opposition is able to appear and is able to uh, sort of develop at least a prima facie case 
in favor of their opposition. That would be an issue being joined, right? You, you at least you have two. It was a really good explanation of that. Right. Um, I did look it up because I wanted to make sure I was right. My understanding was right. So you, because in theory, an issue isn't actually joined if you raise an issue, your opponent says, I oppose, but never actually produces even a prima facie case to oppose you. Right, and the party raising the issue has to also produce evidence in, in support of their position. Right, you have to have colorable claims, right? right. Um, <clears throat> so the board found in Fairfield, the issue of permanency had not been raised. It was not an issue at the time of the hearing at which the judge tried to invoke the safety valve. And this is good language, to find otherwise would mean essentially that the safety valve provision would automatically trigger if 130 weeks had passed from the date of the accident without either party obtaining a permanency opinion. That is great. That's exactly what we wanna hear. So for us in the practice and for all of you handling claims, what that means is it's okay if you miss it. It's okay because it doesn't matter it's an affirmative obligation that has to meet four criteria for us to have the safety valve triggered. So if you're after 130 weeks and you're paying temporary partial, <clears throat> your credit's accruing. Hopefully. Um, oh. Yeah. Hopefully. So this is they start missing facts. It's the third criteria, I put this quote at the bottom. They, in the third criteria, which is say in their analysis of that, that the only indication that the claimant was raising the issue of maximum medical improvement was for counsel's RFA1. In fact, I think this fact actually speaks more intelligently to the issue of whether permanency was at issue. Answered essentially the shenanigans going on here by saying, the mere filing of an RFA one by counsel does not indicate that an issue is raised. An issue of medical data is raised in doctor report. They said it that way. Sorry. For the carrier to obtain an IME. So, and then they also use language later on in that heritage, or no, the Fairfield Fairfield Inn's decision. Mm -hmm. it, and this, this is what I find problematic about the decision. It says that the board panel emphasizes that it's fine to that the claimant was not at MMI 130 weeks after the date of accident application of the valve right, right. and Possibly. and my problem with that is that how do you provide the carrier with a reasonable opportunity to get an IME on the issue of MMI at 130 weeks after the date of accident if permanent which is particularly compelling too given the the target case which we're going to talk about a little bit later makes it clear that you cannot retroactively impose a PPD finding you have to run TPD benefits right up to the date of the LWAC, and then you impose the cap. And that's another, that's confusing as well, because the language of the statute suggests that, and I'm sorry to get a little far afield here, and this is probably putting the cart before the horse, but the language of the statute seems to suggest that you can get credit for weeks of temporary benefits paid, or for weeks of benefits paid after the MMI finding, but prior to classification. Right. Okay. <clears throat> So now we're talking about case number two, which is Heritage Christian. This decision is only a couple months after um, Fairfield Inn. Claimant's counsel has now gotten smart and they learned in the first case that their RFA1 wasn't enough. So now what they did was they sent a letter to the treating doctor and got them to fill out a C4.3 that said no MMI on it. And then they brought that to court and they said, let's see what they make of this. <clears throat> so in matter of Christian home, the board says that counsel's attempt to trigger the safety valve by obtaining a medical report from a treating provider, which certifies the claim has not reached MMI is maybe met, maybe unmet. 
but they simply say that permanency was not at issue. And again, they go in and say that the only indication that the claimant was raising the issue of maximum medical improvement was her counsel's RFA1. So they kind of ignore the C4.3 to some, in some purpose, to some purpose, but then they also indicate that number three wasn't met, which was the carrier's opportunity to produce contrary medical. So in Heritage Christian, they find that the safety valve is not triggered as well. And again, they reemphasize that, that, that theory, that ground that they're trying to stake out, that they, don't, they will not accept that permanency is at issue. How do I put this? Unless permanency is actually at issue. What, so what they're trying to do is without saying it, they're trying to preclude fabricated or evidence of no MMI as sufficient basis to trigger the safety valve. What they're trying to do is reserve the triggering of the safety valve for cases where the claimant is after 130 weeks is receiving benefits and may have a permanent disability. What they want you to do is litigate permanency, like somebody come in and say SLU or PPD and then litigate that issue. And if you find that the claimant has not reached MMI as a result of that litigation, then the safety valve would trigger. They don't want to trigger the safety valve simply by claimant's bar teeing up a farce and saying, yeah, the claimant isn't at MMI. So I can imagine for their side of the table, this has got to be frustrating because the board is speaking in sort of riddles and maybe not necessarily speaking to what the legislature said, but they're definitely following what the legislature wrote. <clears throat> we got Magellan Concrete, which is the third case, April 30, 2021. So now we're, we're a couple months later. Claimant's doctor files a report specifically indicating no MMI. The board comes back. Both parties had agreed at a hearing that the issue of permanency should be deferred at that time and revisited after the carrier had obtained its IME. As such, permanency was not at issue at the time of the January 26, 2021 hearing. This is a theory about joinder. This is a little bit about joinder, and this is also a little bit about the board's staked out territory about wanting it to be legitimate questions of permanency as opposed to fabricated litigation on no MMI, right? So they find essentially there's no joinder because there was the carrier hadn't had an IME. So permanency wasn't at issue until the carrier, potentially until the carrier had the IME. But we don't have enough case law yet to tell us what happens next. That would be the nice part. Criteria number one again, and I think criteria number one is going to be the one that generates all the case law. Well, I think one and then a little bit more three and the other two are, are, you know, pretty simple. You know, it's whether there's the time has run and then whether the board has made a ruling on it, right? Because the, you know, whether the board's made a ruling or not is sort of a bimodal state. There either is a ruling on it or there isn't. So our next case, North American Breweries, December 11, 2020, while numerous physicians testified that the claimant had not reached MMI and where the only physician who was the IME who had opined MMI had been precluded. Permanency was not currently at issue. Here's that joinder theory again. The issue wasn't joined because the only a contrary evidence that the carrier submitted had been precluded. <coughs> and everyone else in the record says no MMI. Furthermore, the judge hadn't made a determination of MMI in the case, which is funny because in the board's own rest of the decision below. So the board concludes that the judge's decision below properly found that the safety valve uh, to be triggered would have been premature. So they said basically, as permanency has not been established, the board panel finds that the issue of section 15.3W safety valve applicates retroactive application. It could be. I see litigation on this. I really do. I, there's going to be a ton of it. Yeah. It's, but we're not at that step yet because the board has sort of tamped it down. And the second layer cases, 
that are the ones that are going to really generate, I think, a lot of the fight haven't happened yet, or they're in the process of happening now. suggests that the board's position is you can't apply for applicability of the AP bill until you actually jam them and you are deemed yeah. so they harken back to their old case this could be safety the determination is premature pending a determination of permanency in the claim which really does put the claimant at the claimant is well, they right. do protect their client by and having that that medical report in the in the file. The carrier's got in a bad position too because the carrier hasn't taken any steps to join the issue. So then the, the board and have the jurisdiction to go back and make a safety valve finding. It's about whether or not what kind of steps you might take in order to protect yourself. You know, if the claimant does produce evidence that that's not MI hundred weeks after, and and you know, like, is it better to not have that evidence? The situation that existed at the time time that the claimant produced an MMI opinion or lack of MMI opinion, or is it smarter to get a record from a physician at that time and to provide you with an opinion that the claimant is at MMI based on... So that's going to trigger, that's going to trigger litigation. No, you don't have to produce the record review until you decide you want to use it at a hearing, right? I guess you could sit on it, yeah. Yeah, you can sit on it for a couple of years, maybe. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm I'm a little bit like how we're going to approach this one when, when it's. It's going to be a lot of after depend the fact upon litigating the claim or the facts that you know present themselves and what we're doing, whether we're trying to re but, litigate retroactivity or whether or not you know it's a current case. But the thing that I find interesting is is that the statute creates a presumption, and it uses the mandatory language "shall," so it shall count. I don't know. I think that means that I think the default position, the strong litigation position is that the default is, is that all these weeks are counted against the cap unless the claimant proves that he was not at MMI at the time. And that would be assuming that we were years later litigating back to what's going on in the past. And that would assume that it would survive any claim of latches. <laughs> That's a great um, point. You know, if you can keep it the focused on a presumption that permanency, that the claimant should be at MMI two and a half years after, after the accident, right? Like, like, I mean, you know, just in the real world, like if you have a personal injury action and there's a, you know, there's liability, um, a liability action, like these cases don't drag on like this, you know, I mean, even with back cases, they have surgery and then three months later, they're at MMI and you can litigate what their future damages are. It's only in comp land that we have like these like, protracted periods of healing. So right. I, I like your emphasis on that, that the, the language of the statute is is mandatory and I would love to in fact I what I'll do after the our presentation is just take a look at the bill jacket to see if we can get any memos of support um, yeah. from the governor's office or from labor or from the board um, in support of the amendments to legislation all right <clears throat> so we're still on Number one. Next case, extreme building. That was really sketchy, me, but whatever. This is, I'm going to call this instructive dicta. So the board tells us that ongoing cause related disability um, is an issue that could be resolved, right? So they litigated. So now what the claimants attorneys are doing is they're expressly litigating degree, right? And they're arguing that the board's or court's finding of an ongoing temporary disability of any sort, permanent or partial, um, permanent or, or, I mean, sorry, total or partial, triggers the safety valve 
because now the board is making an implied, if not expressed finding, that the claimant has not reached MMI because they are now awarding post 130 week temporary benefits to a claimant. In this case, in dicta, the board resolves the disability finding, but then goes ahead and says, this is a post-reform case and the carrier is going to be eligible for a credit for temporary disability benefits paid beyond 2.5 years or 130 weeks as the date of accident is April 24th, 2017. They went out of their way to say that. That's the only thing that they say about this section of the statute in this case. So don't think that it's like some, this is some sort of, you know, uh, you know, like practice commentary type of analysis in this case. Switch but, you in. It's not that. No, it's not that, but it's, it's, it's instructive dicta. And so I come from that in my little green highlight saying even potentially a board ruling resolving ongoing temporary disability does not satisfy requirement number one, because as we talked about joinder and permanency being at issue, permanency is not at issue. What was only at issue was whether the claimant was permanent or was temporary total or temporary partial or degree of disability, one of those two things. All right. Number three, this is the reasonable opportunity to obtain an IME. We're gonna go back to Fairfield, which talks about this case, the, this, this criteria in some issue, right? We told you from the statute at the beginning, I probably should have had a way to like bring all four back in one place so we just keep referring to them, but. I know, I was just thinking it actually, cause I have it printed up here. Yeah, yeah, my slide deck would be a lot better if I had just re-interspersed that a couple of times. Well, just uh, run through them real quick again. One is when permanency is at issue. Yep. Two is when the claimant has submitted medical evidence that he or she is not at MMI. Yep. Three is that the carriers had an opportunity to get an IME, reasonable opportunity concerning MMI. And then four is that the board has determined that the claimant is not at MMI. Right. And isn't it funny how number two seems to be sort of thrown out? Yeah. Or at least it's being mixed with number one to say that, you know, like a claimant can produce evidence of no MMI, but that doesn't mean that if that permanency is at issue. Right. So, you know, if you're trying to create an issue where none exists, that is to say, if you're trying to argue with yourself that you're not at MMI, then you don't get to trigger the safety valve. <clears throat> I mean, once again, I think it's the board is trying to do what the legislature intended, but the legislature wrote this mealy mouthed regulation or this statutory amendment and probably did it in such a way to satisfy, you know, the special interest, the claimant's bar, the plaintiff's bar that gets big, that gets involved in this bigly, yeah, you know, bigly. Yeah, bigly. Yeah. Um, I'm All just right. seeing, I'm just so, you know, I'm seeing some questions coming under the chat. So we'll get to those at the end. Okay. So a reasonable opportunity to obtain an, MMO, uh, an IME. So the board in Fairfield says that, you know what, the record, the review indicates the only indication that the issue is being raised was the RFA one. The hearing was held less than six weeks later and before the carrier had an opportunity to request an IME. Remember, this is the first case. This is where the boneheaded judge, whoever they were, just said, yeah, I saw your MMI or your, I, or your RFA and I agree, no MMI, thank you. And they said, as of the time the judge made that ruling, the carrier hadn't been given an opportunity to get an IME. There was no indication that permanency was an issue. Um, and uh, the claimant hadn't even produced an opinion of no MMI. They just simply filed a report that said the claimant was TP. So Fairfield in, I think this is pretty straightforward. Three seems to be pretty easy, right? Magellan Concrete, the next case, talks about number three as well. So we're, I just, I'm sorry, I kind of split them off by element as opposed to case because I thought it might be easier this way. Um, you know, the issue of whether the claimant was at MMI was only joined when Dr. Goals had the IME, filed his C4.3 after a subsequent hearing. So the carrier gave notice of a scheduled IME less than four weeks later, and the hearing on that issue was held less than two weeks after that, right? So the, this is the board misstating what joined means. They think the issue was joined just because the claimant produced a, an, a, a, an, an MMI opinion, right? So I don't know. I don't understand it. But they said that the board finds that the time of the January 26th hearing, which was before they could even get their IME, the carrier had not been given an opportunity to obtain an IME. 
Okay. Seems pretty simple, right? I just wish the board would be more careful with how they wrote these decisions. All right. What if the safety valve isn't triggered? That's all we've got, by the way, on elements, because we only have 11 cases that discuss this. And as you can see, they are not the most articulate cases. In some ways, they're clear as mud. In some ways, they contradict themselves. And in some ways, they misstate even what the issue joined means. Um, <clears throat> but we do have a couple other cases to talk about. We want to talk about Vassar College, which is another one of these cases. So this is talking about, I believe, manner and method of taking the credit. The first case was horribly written and left the issue that was actually in dispute unanswered. And the board very easily could have done that, but they didn't. In Vassar College, the carrier says, I've got this 130 week credit. I paid X number of weeks after 130 temporary partial benefits. We just classified the claimant. The effective date of the classification should be moved retroactively to account for my credit. Right. Do you guys understand the concept? So it's like we walked into a hearing. The judge says, I'm starting the caps today. The defense attorney said, well, wait, your honor, I have a 30 week credit. We need to start the cap 30 weeks ago so that as of today, the claimant's 30 weeks into his cap. That's how we want to do this. The board in Vassar College throws the target case in our face again. They use it all the time. Target just says the cap runs as of the date of the LWAC finding, not before. And in Vassar College, they say, target applies. The carrier is not gonna allow, be allowed to take a credit for the temporary benefits by method of retroactively starting the cap back 130 weeks. But in Vassar, the only legal ruling they make is that you can't retroactively start a cap. They didn't mention how the carrier was gonna take credit for the temporary benefits paid in excess of 130 weeks. James, can you, I can, I'm, I'm having trouble wrapping my brain around why the carrier would make the argument in the first place. I, I don't know. I think that was just how they want, they wanted the cap expiration date. Maybe there was an issue of treatment or something that it would have been advantageous for them to have a <coughs> cap date 30 weeks prior to when it, well, permanency it, date, you know, 30 weeks prior to when it actually became effective. It could, I guess it could be that. It could also be that um, they didn't want to have to come back for another hearing to, to establish the credit. When the credit was exhausted or because, when, the, when the caps were exhausted? Because the statute says that you can suspend when the caps are exhausted without a hearing. You don't need a hearing. Right. So, but you might need a hearing to suspend when you take your credit. So I could see me doing that being like, okay, like this is how we're gonna do this because the cap's gonna end on this date and that's it. And then we never have to reopen this file again if, the, if our client doesn't want to or the claimant doesn't want to. And the caps are just gonna expire without further need for anyone to do any, anything sort of Herculean. Um, but I think I would have also argued barring that, I would have said, well, then make the finding that the credit begins as of this date and that we may suspend benefits as of that date, barring any RFA to, a, challenge, well, you can't challenge labor market anymore, so it doesn't matter, right? So they're just gonna collect the credit unless they die. That's the only reason the case would come back on the calendar in that instance. But um, <clears throat> in Unitego CSD, which is one of, again, one of the few cases on this, the board reiterates the holding about target. You can't change the start date of the caps to reflect the credit. But then they also rescinded the entire permanency finding and returned the matter to the WCLJ, noting that the pending decision is to include a ruling on the SIE's claim to a credit for benefits paid beyond 130 weeks. This does one of two things. It either puts plugs a hole in the Vassar College case that you need to figure out how to take the credit, or this goes back to Melissa's theory that the board is going to treat the 130 week credit like labor market attachments, something that you cannot address or you should not address until you're at the time of permanency and then determine if it applies or not at that moment, like as a snapshot in time, which would be. 
Right. So then if you're entitled to 425 weeks, they'll calculate, the judge will calculate how many weeks you'd be entitled to as a credit against the 425 weeks and then determine that the caps would expire after right. whatever the requisite number of weeks was. Right. And when they say they just returned it to, to include a ruling on the SIE's claim for credit for benefits. If somebody out there happens to be the carrier on this case, can you please like tell us what happened? Because I'm interested to see what the judge said, because you could read it one of two ways. You could read it as they're sending it back for the judge to say the carrier is entitled to a 37 week credit based on X, or they're sending it back to the WCLJ and he thinks that they mean or she thinks that they mean I'm supposed to hold the trial to find out if the safety valve had been triggered in the past retroactively and if they're entitled to a credit in the first instance. I, I hope to God it wasn't the latter. Because that would essentially. Well, I took it as it just to like they rescinded the permanency finding because the permanency finding wasn't supported by the evidence. Maybe. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Wrap up. This is the big old wrap up. Be aware of the 130 week mark on pending claims. So okay. any case with a date of accident at, on or after 4-10-17, be aware that you're into already the two and a half year period. Yeah, you're taking cap credits under well, certain circumstances. Well, depends on the date, but right. if, if the date of accident is at, on or after 4 10, 17, make sure that you look at whether or not you're more than two and a half years after the date of accident. Right. Examine right claims for sufficient TB, TP benefits. Are you... If it's right, now you're going to look at it. Are you paying TP benefits? Because, I mean, it would probably be a good practice that when a claim comes in, you just set your 100, your 130-week diary because you never know what's going to happen on any claim in the first instance. So the diary comes up, you have a peak. Are you paying TP benefits? Is there a credit potentially accruing on the case, right? And then always, always, always. Um, you know, and I think adjusters play a huge role, in my opinion, adjusters and claims examiners of all sorts play a huge role in teeing up their attorneys. Um, because I know when somebody comes, at, uh, an adjuster comes to me uh, to handle something and they, they come in guns blazing and they're like, this is what I really want to do. Like, I think this is, you know, you know like we got to really put them to their proofs. I think this is a perfect place for adjusters to really improve the practice too by going at your counsel and saying, listen, I see a 130 week issue here. They haven't done jack about it. Let's get our credit, go do it, right? That's a <laughs> I have a different theory on that. <laughs> yeah, well, but remember the burden rests with the claimant. Right, exactly. So I would be very cautious about getting an IME on permanency two well, and a half years after your date of accident. Well, because that's what I said. The presumption is, as my very bright partner pointed out earlier, the presumption is that payments on or after 130 weeks from the date of accident are a credit. Right. We're so just you want to risk losing that presumption by going out and getting a terrible IME that says like, yeah, no, he's not an MMI. He's not going to be an MMI for five years. Well, see, the thing is that kills me is that the board has hoped was to us so ridiculous ways of doing things and their ridiculousness has sort of like spread like it spread like covid to the appellate division who's now on their own terror of yes yeah, that's true so i wouldn't put it past the board to say well the safety valve gets litigated once at the time permanency is actually established and that's when we're going to go back and see if the safety valve had been triggered at some point in the past and that's why and i liked my record review idea yeah. Um, because you I can just put that in your pocket then, right? Yeah. I wish we had more cases. We should have invited Dave Wertheim to come to this and been like, which one is it? You know, like, which one is it going to be? Can we, because it's, it's going to be a big deal. Yeah. It's either going to be a boon for us or it's going to be the biggest red herring, like boondoggle, like attachment to the yeah. statute. It'll be yet another nonsense uh, quid pro quo compromise that was supposed to help business when we gave our shirts away and we didn't, we're not actually getting any benefit from it. Um, and, and then I, you need to remember that a no MMI finding from a claimant's doctor is probably a ploy to trigger the safety valve. 
just because Connors and Ferris has been testing this doesn't mean that the other people are smart enough or on top of the ball enough that they won't try this. So if you see a no MMI finding out of the blue, which is pretty rare, right? Like how often do you see a treating doctor go out of their way to check no MMI on a C4.3? You see that this is what you know what's going on. This is the most likely thing anyway. And remember how the credit is affected in our favor is not fully resolved, but we do know for certain it does not shift the data permanency retroactively. That's the only thing we know about it is that the credit can't be taken by simply saying that the PPD started 30 weeks ago. So somehow the credit has to be reflected in the ongoing weeks. I mean, it would be awesome if you, what you could do is you could take the credit right up front and then make the claimant wait to collect, start collecting the PPD, go back to work. And then you're just gonna have to pay like an RE. And it's gonna probably be a small RE because they gotta go back to work and make a living. Because you know, 15 bucks an hour, um, 40 hours a week, off the you know minimum wage is enough to wipe out most claimants' average weekly wages by their RE. So, you know, that would be cool. But you know, the board's not going to permit that. What they're going to, what they probably will let us do is claim the credit at the end of the cap, so that we would end it early. And what they're probably going to do is make us file an RFA to enforce it. Like they're going right, to make it. Then you have to pay benefits past the time you file your RFA to suspend. Right. Well, you're waiting for them to resolve. Oh, you're it. waiting for them to schedule a hearing. I know. Yeah. It's so funny. The only thing, the only thing I thought was interesting recently about a similar issue was the appellate division re, uh, did reverse the board and said that a carrier was absolutely entitled to suspend benefits on the claimant's receipt of third-party proceeds without. Um, and that the, the board was improper for directing the carrier to, to continue payments while they try, while the board figured out what to do about it. <laughs> so um, there might be some precedent going forward for maybe some additional exceptions to the suspend without order um, regulations under 300.23. So we'll have to see, those might be in the making. Um, all right, we be done. Thank you all. We did yammer on for a long time. I said this. I was know be we did. We should yeah. have known, and with you and me together on a presentation. <laughs> yeah, we talked a lot. So on. we got we got questions in the chat. You said, Melissa, I'm gonna yeah. um, I'm gonna stop my share, and let's see what we got in the chat. We have one of our attorneys using foul language. Where? Oh, I <laughs> thought I was the only one that did that. Um, so <laughs> Leonard. Well. So Leonard Elliott, if a person is being paid on a TR, does that count towards 130 weeks? Um, yes and no. I'm going to tell you if it's a TR on a question of TT versus TP, it does not until you resolve it. If it's a TR on a question of rate of partial, I would say it counts whether it's resolved or not. Right. So I don't know. I, I believe we made that clear, but payments of temporary total benefits are not a credit even if made after 130 weeks from the date of accident. Right. That was the, that was what we talked about when we said section 15, five, because right. section 15, 15, four talks about temporary total 15, five talks about temporary partial rates. So if, if your TR, if your tentative rate is because you're litigating total and partial or arguing total and partial, which section of the statute applies is an issue. So I don't think you'd be allowed to take any credit until you resolve that question. Oh, I like this Rachel Egan. She said exactly what I said. That's my observation, Rachel, about um, the record review um, meeting the requirements of an IME. Um, it does not need to meet the requirements of an IME. So that's a way that you could get a record review on the issue of MMI and then reserve it until, I guess my question on that though is the um, request for information, James. Wasn't there, haven't we done research on whether or not the request for information has to be provided to all parties? Yes, the RFI does. That's the problem. There's, if you, you don't do, have to disclose the report, right? No, you don't have to disclose the report. Okay. You do not. So, um, hold on a second. There we go. Are you still there? I am. Okay. All right. Um, so what's next? 
should we request our IME vendors to opine on MMI without permanency and then possibly do an addendum regarding permanency later once the safety valve issue has been ruled on? That could be viable way to do it because as you discussed with the claimant's attorneys um, producing evidence of MMI, that wasn't sufficient to show that permanency was issue at issue. Right. And in fact, I, I'm just noting too, Brian pointed out excellently going back all the way to 2013, that when this is the one where the board announced the expedited permanency part and they laid out criteria for what constitutes MMI, which were subsequently incorporated into the new guidelines, the permanency guidelines, that basically there are only very few circumstances where the board deems their additional time necessary to reach MMI. So maybe what we need to really do is circle the wagons on what does not constitute MM, no MMI. Right, right, which is why I liked your emphasis on the mandatory language of the statute and the focus on the being a presumption, you know, that two yeah. and a half years should be a long enough period of time for anybody to have either have permanency from the accident or not have permanency from the accident. Right. Okay, Kim Snyder's, if a case has been classified and the credit was not raised, but would have been applicable, can the carrier raise the issue after the fact? Absolutely, I think so. I would say absolutely, yeah. Because the statute says shall, you shall have yep. a credit. So what, what is the board gonna do? Say you made a mistake? They say, well, listen, your, your judge made the mistake too. He was sitting, the, or he or she was sitting in the same damn room as the three of us, claimant, claimant's counsel and carrier's counsel. And I, I just filed, I'd calculate what the credit is and I would um, file an RFA that just simply said, um, seeking an administrative determination as of the date that the cap expires so that the carrier may suspend as of that date to consider the credit. And then it'll, you know, it, either they're gonna do that or they're gonna bring it on for a hearing and you're just gonna look for a prophylactic ruling saying the credit is X weeks, the carrier may suspend as of Y date. Missy Krupka um, points out, uh, makes a very good point too, that um, in a couple of years, if you've made payments, you know, for a claim with a date of accident, at or near the original date of the legislation back in April 2017, the number of weeks that somebody's paid since that time could exceed the number of weeks for the PPD. That is such a brilliant observation. Yeah, that's great. So that's why, that's one of the reasons like yeah. I've, for some of my clients, I tell them like, look, you know what, the only thing at issue here is palliative treatment. Like, I really think that we have a great argument that this person is at MMI, trying to go like, for the claimants to try and go back and litigate that this person isn't at MMI at this point in a retroactive way is gonna be very challenging. So every payment you're making right now is a credit against an eventual cap when the claimant gets classified. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, it, I guess the question is, is it's now a balancing of, you would have to have a very specific claim where you were just happy to leave it. I have one like that. Yeah. So we're just, we're, we've been litigating spinal cord stimulator. And so my position on the spinal cord stimulator, and I've been really been litigating it for like two years. So my position on the spinal cord stimulator is that it's palliative. It's not curative. Right. And, and this, so there's really, I'm like, this guy's like, he's too, I mean, I, I think he hit the, the, the 130 weeks. It was in April of last year, I believe. So the client and I have agreed that we're not getting an IME on permanency. We're just going to let it ride. Because you're basically prepaying the cap. Right. <clears throat> and there's, and, and then if there, well, and then if there is permanency finding and the credit is substantial, your ATF deposit would be tiny, right? If you had to make one, the claimant, I mean, the claimant's going to flip. Yeah, I know. Shit, because they're probably not even paying attention to that. No, I don't think they are. It's kind of cruel, actually. <laughs> but I like it. I like it, too. And just jumping in here, uh, tying back to that subject number. So in order to have their even have an opinion, the claim is not a max medical improvement, they need that C4.3. And in there, the provider needs to document the treatment the claimant's receiving, specific improvements that are expected, the time frame which is expected for the claimant to reach MMI, which none of them ever do. Right. And you know that um, like improvement of pain, like that's not, that's not an improvement in somebody's condition. That's an improvement in their subjective experience and symptom, right? Right. 
So, I mean, if surgery is not contemplated, I, that's, I guess that's where I was leery about like getting an IME once you're into the cap, once you're past the cap period. And with the spinal cord simulator, this is Shannon just jumping in. I had that similar situation, but we did get an IME to try to push MMI. It's not this issue. It was, it's a, it's a pre 2017 case. Yeah. And we had very bad lucks with doctors saying, well, because there was a spinal cord stimulator implant, that's a surgery and we won't have MMI, MMI for another year, even though me oh. and the adjuster know that that is wrong. So wrong. That, that's so the I, killer I, right there. I think you're going the right way, not getting an IME on that case. Yeah. Um, I'm also very aggressive about uh, taking it into account for settlements, like, you know, pre-classification if we're past the cap, past the presumptive period. I tell the claimants like, yeah, I'm taking a credit for that. Like you're not getting 400 weeks, even though we all agree that this guy's going to be a 75% LWAC. Like we're taking a credit for, you know, 40 weeks of the cat. Yeah. That's so cool. You can lop off a huge chunk of a cap. Yep. Without them even paying attention to it. I mean, even if they're not going really to, but, but wait a second, it's really not lopping it off necessarily, right? I mean, as compared to before the reform, it is a savings, right? But compared to post reform, whether you pay it as a cap week or you pay it as a non cap week makes no difference, right? What it does is it, um, re it's the really, I believe, and that's why I'm interested to look at the bill jacket for the, um, the legislative memos to see if there's anything from the board or from the governor, or from, from labor or from, from business. Uh, it, the, you know, we were all colluding, all of us. I, you know, we blame it on claimants and on the board that, you know, we were delaying permanency findings after the 2007 reforms, but it was really like, I had clients who were like, Melissa, please help me avoid a permanency finding because I don't want to have to do the deposit into the ATF. So, you know, I mean, like the, the length of time between the accident and when somebody was eventually classified with having a PPD and the LWEC weeks were actually kicking in was being artificially delayed years beyond what it had been previously because there was an incentive on both sides for the parties to delay the finding. Especially since cases become, have become more expensive too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the yeah. wage went up and I mean, like people, we had clients who were you know, they were technically, you know, they have big self-insured retention. So they're liable for the first $500,000 in benefits and they're, but they're, they're, they have a carrier and so they're subject to the ATF deposit. So the ATF deposit comes along is $250,000. dollars i can have to put in the ATF. Right. So, I, I mean, I had, we had lots of clients that were interested in delaying a permanency finding. So I really think that this legislation was meant to try and back it up again. Although I, I you know, it's like bringing a, a rusty butter knife to to do surgery um, because it's just a matter of time, I think, before the parties, like especially the claimants bar, like figures out a way to whittle away at the protections. And even when we do have the board on our side, like we did with the schedule issues and the, um, the LWAC weeks, so, you know, I mean, like uh, all the things where the, where the third department is abrogating rulings of the board to try and um, effectuate the legislative purpose. Um, you know, I think it's a matter of time before ultimately this gets eroded again. So we should all be very active, I think, in our chambers of commerce and, um, you know, just collectively as a group. I'd invite everybody to come to the, to the New York Workers' Compensation Forum on LinkedIn, um, you know, attending things like this and becoming educated about, you know, how these things evolve and just being aware of the kind of the behind, behind the scenes politics like James brought into the conversation, which I think is really important. Well, everybody, it's 10 after. If there are no more questions. I think we're gonna call it a day. It's Friday at 1.10, everybody go home. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> well, so I'll see you Monday. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks for watching us at Lomad. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate your participation.